What's up my cartoon connoisseurs? Today I've got something very special in store for you because we're doing the official 2000s children's cartoon tier list. That's right, it's a tier list video because these do very well in the YouTube landscape and I got shit to say about a bunch of these, alright? I got shit to say. So, you know the deal. I give you the truth, the truth, and nothing but the objective truth and in return you share this video on like Facebook gaming or whatever. Alright, you can put this video in the background or whatever, there's not gonna be much to see, it's a tearless video, it's mostly audio. And without further ado, let's get started with some of the classics. I wanna start with Adventure Time. Adventure Time! Adventure Time as a show should be S tier. Except it's held back by the very, very heartbreaking fact that for the first couple of seasons, they don't know what they want their own show to be. The history and the world building that exists in the land of Ooh and all of its characters is incredible. Like, I want to explore more of it, and that's very hard to get your viewers to want that, like in terms of a storytelling standpoint. It's the dream of every single D&D campaign writer. And Adventure Time does all that, it does it incredibly. I want to learn every single moment that Simon Petrikov spent during the big war or whatever going on, like a thousand years before the events of the story, Except, you know who doesn't want to explore that? The writers themselves! They don't want to explore the interesting world building that they've put into this world. I care about the history of all their characters. They don't. They care about the everyday adventures of Finn and Jake and like a random donkey looking at them from outside their window and then being like, oh my god, that donkey is so creepy for 11 fucking minutes. I don't care, man! I don't care! I don't give a shit! Give me Simon Petrikov! Give me the fucking events that led up to the giant explosion that's just fucking taking out a chunk of the entire world! Adventure Time shoots itself in the foot by actually showing us that there is a deeper meaning to this, that there is something to be explored and then not exploring it. It's like the show equivalent to blue balling your viewers. Just fucking jerking them for two seasons straight without ever letting them come. Look, okay, forget about the gooning analogy. Okay, it doesn't matter. The point is, Adventure Time should be an S tier with everything that it can do. Except it goes down to A tier because their own writers don't respect the amazing work that they've put into it. Regular Show is the complete opposite of this. Regular Show does not try something as ambitious as Adventure Time. In fact, Regular Show tries something very regular. It's extremely episodic, up until the last season, but like, otherwise, it's extremely episodic. There is nothing to explore about the world, because it's just the normal world, it's just the modern Earth that we know about. So there's nothing interesting to explore about this fantasy setting that they put us in. Yeah, the main characters, or like the recurring characters, are not human, okay. But that's not a big mystery that needs to be solved, that's just some cartoon logic. The same reason why everything in Gumball is like a Gumball machine, or a milk carton, or whatever. You don't need to explore that, you know what I mean? It's just cartoon logic. So there's no big lore mysteries to be solved in regular show, and so they can get away with doing what they want to do. They have a lot less ambition than Adventure Time, but they are succeeding in what they're trying to do a lot better than Adventure Time. Which is why regular show, for me, is one of the perfect shows of all time. It gets an easy S. And you know, while we're at it, Gravity Falls is also an S. I don't think I need to elaborate on this. Just like, every, everyone agrees that Gravity Falls on us. Next up we got Gum- Now Gumball, suffers the exact same thing as Adventure Time Syndrome, where the show itself, I think, is really good. It's very episodic, it doesn't ever try to do something serialized that's got, like, big lore to it or whatever. But also, in the first three seasons, it doesn't know what it wants to be. Maybe Adventure Time always knew what it wanted to be, but specifically refused to explore it, I don't care about that. But Gumball clearly doesn't know what it wants to be. It's only starting at season three, where it discovers its own characters. Because the first season is all about Gumball and Darwin being insufferably stupid. And I get that that's the premise, but they, even the creators themselves, realize that after season two, that's not a good premise. You can't make a show out of that and keep it entertaining. And so they had to switch it around a lot and they had to change their world and their characters and really flesh them out. And starting season three, does Gumball really become the comedic masterpiece that it becomes? Because you look at Gumball and some of the jokes that you see there are like so ahead of its time for when the episode came out. The jokes are amazing. It just took them so long to find that. And I feel like if they knew what they wanted to do with the cartoon from the start, it would have been a lot better. And it would have actually gotten me to sit down and watch all of Gumball, maybe. Which is why it should be an A tier, for all it could have been, but goes down to B tier because they don't know who they are in the earlier seasons. B for Ball. B for Ball from Gumball. And A for Adventure Time. Oh my god. And S for Show. Holy shit. Holy shit. We Bear Bears. <laughs> this show is painfully mediocre. <laughs> It doesn't do anything great because it doesn't try to do anything great. And the only reason to watch the show is because Ice Bear is such a goat. And if he wasn't there, it feels like nothing ever happens in any of the episodes. And thus, there are two other characters who are just completely taking up screen time for no reason whatsoever. And thus, We Bear Bear gets a C for the C in Ice Bear and nothing else. We Steven Universe could have been great, but they really fucked it up by not taking their own show seriously. 
It feels like every other episode, there was a plot twist that was unnecessary or just a retconning of previously established events for no reason whatsoever, just because of the fact that I feel like the writers behind the scenes couldn't, like, agree on what they wanted the show to be. And because of that, it's just very sad that Steven Universe could have been an S tier right up there with Gravity Falls, but unfortunately had to fall down to an A tier. Otherwise, I think it's a great show. I don't care about what people say about it being like just like lesbian propaganda or whatever. I'm just, I'm not getting political here. I'm just talking about if it's a good show or not, buddy. This is children's cartoons that we're talking about here. Get real. Oh, and also banger musical scores. Like if Rebecca Sugar knows how to do one thing is fucking music. Props to her. Clarence. Clarence was a very forgettable show. It was very mid. It was fun. But, you know, there was nothing to it. Clarence himself was very annoying as a character. So, you know, kind of unfortunate that he's the main character. I think his two friends were both more interesting than Clarence himself. And uh, that's all I have to say about it. It's a very mid show. It's a very forgettable show. Uncle Grandpa is the story of an autistic old man. He was autistic, right? We're all on the same page about that. He did not have a sense of time. He thought it was always morning. So I think he might also be slightly senile. And it was just a pain to watch. Even as a child, I could never watch it. I never liked it. The only thing it had going for it was the fact that Mr. Gus was a copy of Squidward from SpongeBob. So he was real as fuck. And also Pizza Steve was a Sigma male before Sigma males were a thing. D tier for uh, the D in Grandpa. Over the garden wall. This show is P E A K peak. I cannot emphasize enough how peak this show is and how sad I am that it went under the radar the way it did. And I understand why it did. Because it's a very niche show, it has one season, it's very serialized. Except it takes what Gravity Falls introduced in the world of these cartoons with like, you know, putting foreshadowing and like these big mysteries and these really serious kind of dark tones and it cranks it all up to 11. Over the Garden Wall knew what it wanted to be and it never lost sight of that the entire way through. It planted clues for the ending of the show from the first ever episode and it always knew what it wanted to do and it did it perfectly and everything about this show is so peak. God damn it! Go watch it! Go watch like a video essay to explain to you in more detail why this show is so good and then go watch the show and then go talk about the show because I need this show to get the attention it deserves! S tier! S plus if it existed, but it doesn't. S tier. Anyways, let's talk about a significantly worse show. Most people hate this show. And there's a reason why they hate this show is because the people who do hate this show are the people who loved the original Teen Titans. Now, I am in a unique and important position to have never watched the original Teen Titans. So you can believe me to give you a perfectly objective rating of Teen Titans Go solely based on its own merits and not comparing it to the original Teen Titans show. They were better than We Bear Bears and Clarence because Teen Titans Go didn't have any insufferable characters and slightly aging them out and putting them to B tier, they also had two hotties in the name of Starfire and Raven. Sonic Boom was unnecessarily good. I watched a couple years ago, so I was not an itty little bitty boy when I was watching this. I was a hairy fucking man. And there were times where I was genuinely laughing out loud alone in my room because I was watching Sonic Boom and Knuckles was carrying half of the episode of the entire series. The writing is just really well done, the jokes are very well crafted for no reason and apparently the games were horrible, I never played it, but let me tell you, the show is not reflective of the games. This is an easy A tier, I had a lot of fun with it, Eggman was always fun to have around, Styx was a great original character, I didn't know much about the Sonic universe before the show, but let me tell you, I enjoyed every moment of it, it was just really fun. Very episodic show, but that doesn't take away from how fun it is. <laughs> oh, fanboy and Chom Chom! This is a stupid show, it never should have existed. <laughs> I don't know why people enjoy the show, I don't know why this is a thing, Fanboy and Chom Chom goes to D. Next up, Atla. Long ago, the four nations lived together in harmony. I need to put this in S tier, uh, Avatar Last Airbender, I need to put this in S tier because if not everyone will come and kill me in the comments and in real life I fear. They named the capital of this great land, Republic City. People who like Avatar Last Airbender sometimes say that Korra is horrible and it's dog shit, but I don't agree with that. I think Korra is pretty good, not as good as the original, but it compares. Zaheer, honestly, the season with Zaheer, I enjoyed it more than the Avatar Last Airbender. I think Zaheer was just a goat. That's all I have to say. That's all I have to say. Now, with Kim Possible, we're going to a different era of cartoons, I guess, because these are all very modern comparatively to the rest of the stuff that we got here. 
and Kim Possible was like half a generation before that. And back then, cartoons followed a different formula. Back then, it felt a lot more like a bunch of scenes strung together and with a faint sense of story being resolved in, you know, 11 minutes or 22 minutes. Back then, it was 11 minutes. But Kim Possible actually managed to tell a cohesive story in the 11 minute runtime that it had for each episode. And also, Kim was a fucking baddie. So once again, edging out over Wee Bear Bears and Clarence, Kim Possible had the hottie. And so it's going to be. Also, Shigo was also a baddie. They were both baddies. She had two baddies. Not enough to be an AT though. This show is very valuable to me. It did something that would be unheard of today. Look at the cartoons that they're showing today on TV, and then look at Flapjack. Look at these scenes. Yes. Just the entire concept of Flapjack is amazing, like they're stuck on these docks that are completely separated from the rest of the world, and everyone in here is like some different flavor of crazy. Their money is candy, which is obviously a euphemism for some sort of substance, either alcohol or drugs or whatever. Their whole thing is to go to the candy island and get high by eating the entire island. Their dream is to find an island full of a substance to abuse. Flapjack for me can be no less than an A tier. Obviously it's not S, because it doesn't do something that's like, oh this is spectacular, the writing is amazing, the animation is amazing, no no no, but... It just, it just goes out the box, and back then, they could get away with that, and I like that Flapjack represents that. Easy A tier, solid A tier. Il de drame total. This show is basically just a cartoon version of Survivor. And the thing about Survivor is it already exists, and it's done with actual real-life humans. Except Total Drama has the advantage of being a cartoon, which lets it crank every single scenario up to a ridiculous 11, perhaps even a 12, which they obviously couldn't do with real humans because real humans have rights and they're not, in fact, cartoon characters. I feel like everything that they did with Total Drama Island was really well executed. They picked the right characters to stay later on so that we had the time to discover them, really. They eliminated the boring characters or the cliche characters early on. They even gave us two alternative endings so that people could watch the person that they were rooting for win the entire tournament. And I feel like everything that they did, they did it perfectly. They had an idea, they executed on it, they didn't try to innovate too much, they didn't try to reinvent the wheel, but let me tell you, they made one hell of a wheel. Chris McLean, my beloved, your show in fact deserves a solid A tier. And this was a heavy heart that I must rate Star Wars The Force of Evil. I used to love this show. I think a lot of people used to love this show. It started off as an A tier, with potential to go up to S with the way they could have handled it. And then with each season, it just fell. And it just fell. Because they had a great thing going, and they ruined it by not caring about this great thing. Every single episode was about something that no one cared about. They just refuse to progress the story. Now, I don't know why that is. I feel like there's a lot of video essays out there that would be exploring this topic. I'm not here to go in depth about any of these. I'm just here to talk about all of them in a very generalized way. Star Wars The Forces of Evil has to get C because of the wasted potential. It could have been so much more, and yet it wasn't. Freshman to fight the forces of evil. I am the ninja. I am Randy Cunningham. A bit of a niche one. I don't think this one set up as many fires around the internet or any community as much as the other shows here did. But it was fun, it was okay. It was entertaining to watch. Like, if I saw it on TV, I'd watch it and I'd be like, damn, that was cool. Randon Cunningham himself wasn't a very annoying character. He was just your default guy, literally just a, a guy in ninth grade. But his sidekick, the fat guy, not that I'm fat phobic, but you know, it's just facts. He was fat, like, he, he was above average, what can I say? He was just, I'm just stating facts. And he was pretty annoying to watch and that's why it can't go above a C tier. But I could stand watching it, I had a good time when I was watching it, so it's not a D tier either. There you go. Next up, Ben 10. And I'm taking Ben 10 by itself because I don't want to separate Ben 10 the original, Ben 10 Alien Force, and then Ultimate Alien, and then Omniverse, or whatever, whatever. No, I'm just taking Ben 10 as a franchise. And I can't give Ben 10 anything less than an S. As a franchise. Imagine how much of an impact Ben 10 has 
not only in general like pop culture, but also in other franchises. Ben 10 has had so many movies made about it. There are so many parodies of Ben 10. There are so many versions of Ben 10. My personal favorite was Omniverse, but I know everyone like simps over Gwen in Alien Force and they're like, oh, Ultimate Alien has the best writing or whatever. So many people have so many opinions on Ben 10 and whether that's a positive or negative, it just shows that they are passionate about this. And there's a reason for that, is because it's a very simple premise with a banger intro song and it just works. What they do with Ben 10, it just works and it's been working for over a decade. Nothing less than a steer. But Generator X by itself had a serious story to tell. With the guy in the sunglasses, I forget his name, I'm sorry. Like a very interesting character that I wanted to find out more about. I was a little wee little lad, and I was like, damn, this guy is cool, and I want to know why he's so serious all the time. Did he get sexually assaulted by his mother? Was Sigmund Freud right all along? It made me ask these questions, and getting a wee little, wee little lad excited about these types of things? It takes some good writing. Alright, we've got two niche ones incoming, so let's do a speed round, shall we? Symbionic Titan, could have been great, Cartoon Network scrapped it before it actually was. B tier for Bionic. Code Leo Code, tried to do something original for its time, it was a bit too ahead of its time, because the technology wasn't there yet, and it's very hard to watch right now because the animation is horrible. C for Code Leo Code, there you go, fits perfectly. Les Aventures de Ladybug et Chat Noir, there we go. <laughs> Emergency Edition. On the spot, Miraculous Ladybug, I think it was pretty good. I think I, I would personally give it an A tier because of what it was, you know, going to be, except the writer did the same thing that Star Wars The Force of Evil did. And you know why? Here's my hot take, here's my hot take, and I think people who have watched Miraculous Ladybug aren't gonna think that this is a hot take. They're gonna be like, damn, this man is spitting, because I'm about to spit. The guy who wrote the show isn't supposed to be a show writer. He's supposed to be a fanfic writer. This guy clearly loves creating OCs. This guy clearly loves just creating characters. And then he was like, oh yeah, I like Paris. Let me put all these characters that I've created into Paris and watch them do their thing and then just not progress them whatsoever. No character developments at all. But for five seasons, I'm going to tease that there's going to be character development. And then, oh, any episode, the entire story could just turn it off its, over its head and you never know what's going to happen. Oh no, is Adrian going to meet that marionette? Is Ladybug? Oh, it's about to happen guys it's about to happen but he's too much of a fucking puss to let his story develop because he doesn't want to change the static characters that he's created he doesn't know how to give them an arc and that is the most frustrating thing about it i'm not saying these cartoons need to have the characters with the arcs most of the cartoons that we put here don't have that because they don't try to kim possible kim possible is kim possible the entire series throughout except they never tease that kim is going to have like a development or a big change in her life Everything is perfectly episodic, except in Miraculous, he wants to have the lack of responsibility of episodic and the tension and drama of a serialized show. You can't have it both, buddy. You can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't eat your cake and have it too. Whatever is the correct term, doesn't matter. You just can't do it, okay? Fuck Miraculous. I used to love the show. I used to love the show. You know what? It gets a fucking D tier just because of how annoyed I get just talking about it. Fuck this show. Fuck this show. It could have been so great. Fuck you. Give it to someone else. Change showrunners. Nothing personal. Never met the guy. Maybe he's great. I don't know. Would like to play chess with him someday. I don't fucking know. There's 104 days of summer vacation. This show is kind of peak. For how stupid it is that they managed to basically recycle the exact same formula for over 100 episodes and keep people engaged. Also, banger musical numbers. Easy A tier. This was a very mid show, I'm gonna be honest with you. The only thing it had good going for it was the fact that Didi's legs went from all the way down from hell to heaven. And also the intro song was pretty good as well. Other than that, all of the characters were kind of insufferable. Like, the mom was very stupid, Didi was really annoying, like I couldn't stand Didi. Dexter himself, the main character, was also pretty annoying most of the time because he was very bratty. Other than that, it's not a D tier, I would watch some episodes, I'd be okay with it. Easy C. We interrupt this program to bring you Courage the Cowardly Dog Show! Courage the Cowardly Dog managed to get away with giving generations of children nightmares for multiple days, and it did it in an incredible way. The setting was so unique, all the episodes were so unique, the concept is so unique. There are two senile old people, and they have this dog who's really supposedly cowardly, except you know what the definition of courage is? The definition of courage is not to not have any fears is to be able to stand up to your fears. 
So really, his name should be Courage, the Courage of the Dawn. Yeah, bro. So true. Yeah. That's deep. Anyways, this show was actually a masterpiece though, because it could only exist in this very specific time period during which it did exist. When cartoons were developed enough for someone to come up with this idea and it actually working, but not developed enough for someone to come up with the idea that maybe we shouldn't do stuff like this in a children's cartoon, you know, maybe that might be a good idea. Basically, all the pieces fell in love just the way they needed to, and I'm so glad they did because Courage the Cowardly Dog is an easy S tier. Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends. This show was okay. That's all I have to say about it. The characters were interesting because back then you're like, oh, this is very interesting. This is like a, this. This guy is very tall and lanky, and he plays basketball. Except wait, he doesn't have one arm. Oh, that's weird. How is he playing basketball with one arm? And oh, there's this guy who can like beat the shit out of every single person in this building. Except he's just a little softy. Oh, he's just a little furball. And then there's this guy who's just the color blue. And he's kind of mischievous, but he's like our main guy. He, he's, he's he's so chill though. And it's just a very interesting cast of characters, it keeps the children busy, and Frankie was a fucking baddie, not gonna lie, which is why it sets it up above the rest, because Frankie's a baddie, and that's all they got going for it. Angelo? Angelo! Angelo rules! This show, I don't know what happened to it. Did it fly off the radar? What happened? I think it got like a reboot at some point, but I don't wanna know, I don't wanna know, I want to live in blissful ignorance because the original Angela Rules was amazing. I love this show. My mom loved this show. Everyone in our family loved this show. We had an alarm. We knew at what time it aired and we would be like, it's Angelo time, it's Angelo time. And it was just such a great show. This is the show in this entire list that would have worked just as well if they just did it in live action. Except the fact that they did it in animation just elevates it further above the rest because not only did they do it in animation, they also did it with such a unique art style in a time where every single show was competing over oh do we use the cal art style or do we use the hanna barbara style and angelo rules fucking ruled s tier bay bay all right we've got another speed round incoming first up super strike sorry super strike cause actually managed to get me to care about a football show and yes if you're a blue lock fan do get offended please so, just for that, it gets a B tier. Pretty good. Doraemon. I don't know why the Japanese are so obsessed with this show. Everyone that I've talked to has agreed that this show is pretty bad. D tier. Camp Laszlo was trying to do what every show at the time is doing. Episodic fun adventures with funny goofy characters and they are all animals because why not? Nothing to write home about. C tier. Camp Lake Bottom tried to do basically the same thing as Camp Laszlo. Very similar settings as well. We don't have animals, we got supernatural creatures, but you know, that's just a coat of paint over the actual show itself. The problem is, it's doing it over a decade later and you know, the fad is over buddy, you missed the train. Go home. D tier. I like the idea that for every new season, or like every new series, I don't know what they called it, the whole story would change. It wasn't just like a new villain, the way Korra did it, no, the entire story would just change, it's just that the art style would stay the same, because, you know, obviously they're Legos, and the characters would stay the same, at least our main crew. But the villain would change, the whole setting would change, and some core parts of the status quo would be significantly altered. And not every show does that, not every show has the courage to grab its own story by the balls and twist it to see how far it can go. I also like that they weren't scared to actually make their characters grow up and evolve over the course of the series. They weren't afraid to have their characters actually be dynamic. Unlike some other show that I can point to here. Overall, it just did everything right, except it didn't do anything outstandingly. And so it can't be an S tier, but it's definitely a solid A. I am Weasel! Next up, I Am Weasel, and in order to talk about I Am Weasel, I need to first talk about Cow and Chicken, because I Am Weasel was a spin-off of Cow and Chicken. Now, I don't have too much to say about these, other than the fact that Cow and Chicken was just an objectively bad show, it had nothing going for it, nothing interesting was happening, it was very boring, D tier, very simple. But, on the other hand, I Am Weasel did have one thing going for it, was the titular character, Weasel himself. And just because Weasel was such a goat, he saves I Am Weasel from going anywhere below B tier. Now also, we have to consider the fact that I Am Weasel was not a very good show, so it can't go anywhere above B tier either. And thus, by process of elimination, we can scientifically conclude that I Am Weasel belongs in B tier. Sugar. Spice. And everything nice. The Powerpuff Girls got away with making one of their main recurring villains literally the devil by hiding the fact that it was the devil, by just never referring to it as the devil and always just calling him him. Not only that, they made this devil character very obviously non-cisgender. And not only that, they made this in a children's cartoon where the main characters who would face off against this devil were three three-year-old girls. 
And not only that, they did all of this in 1998. If that doesn't give them an easy A tier, I don't know what does. The fact that all the episodes were really fun and some of them were extremely unhinged might even boost them up to S tier on a good day though. And today I woke up on the wrong side of the bed, so it's gonna have to settle for an A. Deal with it. Now, I've only watched season 1 of Samurai Jack because I didn't know there were any more seasons of Samurai Jack. Because at the end of season 1, like, the conflict gets resolved, right? He kills Aku, he's done, he's back in his home. Now, I've learned that shit actually starts hitting the fan after season 1, and he goes all like John Wick up in that shit, and shit looks peak from what I've seen. But because I haven't watched it, I can't testify for the other seasons, and so maybe I would have given it an S, but from what I've seen, and from where I'm standing, this show was a solid A tier. That's all I have to say about it. Next up, we got Ultimate Spider-Man. Nothing much to say about it. It was fun. It was Spider-Man. The comedy was fine. It was just an entertaining show. I liked it when it came out. And uh, was it as good as Gumball or was it as good as We Bear Bears? I'd say it was as good as We Bear Bears just simply because of the fact that I wasn't really a Marvel guy. Maybe if I enjoyed Marvel a bit more, I would have liked it more. But it was okay. Every time I came, I was like, okay, Spider-Man, let's watch it. Sure. One, two, three, yeah. This show is carried by an amazing opening soundtrack and blatant misogyny and sexism as they would want you to believe, which is not the case. If you just look past the surface level of Johnny Bravo, you will be able to see that the show isn't actually sexist and misogynist. Johnny is the character who's supposed to represent this womanizer archetype, but he always loses. He never gets the woman. Johnny is the loser of the show. And by making him this misogynist and sexist, the show is actually showing us that this is not the way to act. This is not the way that it should be accepted in society. And because Johnny Bravo is such an old show, let's check. 1997. 1997. Johnny Bravo was saying stuff that needed to be said to children by showing them that Johnny always fails by acting like this. Now the problem with that is that nowadays I think our understanding of children's show is children don't care if the main guy, you know, wins or loses at the end because despite Johnny losing, he was very miserable. That's why, that's what made him so lovable. He was a lovable fool. He kept failing and then he kept trying. He never learned from his mistakes. And that's why he was just lovable, right? But the problem with that is children want to imitate what they see as the main character. And although Johnny Bravo was a great show that managed to do the thing that it wanted to do by critiquing misogyny and sexism and womanizers, I think the problem with making this in a kid's show is that the kids are just going to copy what Johnny does, they're going to imitate it without looking deeper into the fact that, oh, this is actually not what I'm supposed to do. But that's because the children are fucking stupid and not because Johnny Bravo is a bad show, because Johnny Bravo is a great show. Even nowadays, today, you can ironically watch it and actually have fun. Like the jokes are good, it's just an entertaining watch. The character Johnny Bravo is an amazing character. Carl is just like the goats or something. Hello. And just overall, Johnny Bravo has a very special place in my heart. And I think it gets a lot of shit nowadays with people looking back at it two decades after the show came out and critiquing it for being misogynist or sexist when they can't even look past the surface level of the message it's trying to spread. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Oh wait, my TED Talk's not over. We have the other Johnny right after Johnny Bravo. Johnny Test. <laughs> Johnny Test just created a fun environment for a show to live in. The characters that they created around the family, like Bling Bling Boy, the two agents, Agent Black and Agent White, Darth Vegan, Gil. Gil didn't really have anything going in the story. I didn't really care about Gil, I'm gonna be honest. Gil was just there for the sisters to do something when they're not inventing something. Which, I mean, I'm all for creating characters based on purpose. Gil wasn't created because they were like, let's create a character like this, and then they didn't fit him into the story. No, they created Gil because the story needed a character like that, and then they just made Gil only to serve that purpose. Gil doesn't have a personality. They didn't go off a personality and create Gil. Unlike, I don't know, Bling Bling Boy. I feel like Bling Bling Boy, they had an idea for a personality, and let me tell you, it was a good idea, and you just put him in the story. And it works because Johnny Test is very episodic. He doesn't try to do something serious. It's just fun for 11 minutes. And then you're done and you're like, damn, I have tinnitus now. Hell yeah, I'll go for another episode. And that's all I have to say about Johnny Test. And with that, my tier list comes to a close. Lots of shows in A tier because lots of shows are pretty good. And I mean, let's be honest, we forget about the ones that don't make the cuts. So it's obvious that there's going to be less ones down here. I'm sure there are a lot of very influential and important cartoons that I just forgot, that just slipped my mind. So if you remember any of them, let me know down in the comments below, and I'll just reply to it with the official, and it bears repeating, official ranking for that cartoon. Remember, it needs to be from this time era, which is a very wide time era that we've defined here, but just make it around that. I don't want to talk about OKKO, OK you know what I mean? It's too modern, I never watched that on TV. 
Either way, thanks for watching my first slop of a video. That's what I'm gonna start calling these. Like non-scripted, more free-form style content. I'm gonna start calling this slop. This was just me yapping for 30 minutes. If you enjoyed it, I'm glad. If you didn't, let me know so that I don't do any more of this. And I'll catch you guys on the flippity flop.